I am Shusara Konakumara. Welcome to Satsang. You are beginningless. You are endless. You are divine. Good evening, everyone. I'm Shisada, joined with, uh, by PLAN again, as always. And we thank you for joining us tonight for satsang. Uh, let's get started with a protection. I'll ask all of you to go ahead, take a nice deep breath, and get yourselves uh, centered. Mother, Father, God that I am, through the great central sun hierarchy, through the office of the Christ, through the order of Melchizedek, I call upon Archangel Michael to bring the sapphire blue ray. Cut away, cut away, cut away anything in all of our four lower vehicles not emanating directly from our I am presence. I now call on Archangel Zekiel, keeper of the violet flame. Blaze, blaze, blaze the violet flame through all of our four lower bodies. Transmute, transmute, transmute all the psychic debris Michael has cut free. I now bring forth the invincible ring pass knot and the mirror blue light of invisibility to completely surround each of us. And I call forth a shaft of pure Christ light for each one of us listening to the program. And I ask that these shafts of light be brought to the center of the earth where I call on Archangel Gabriel to seal them. And I ask that the legions of Michael completely surround each tube of light. And now I ask that our vibrations be raised high above the psychic and astral worlds to the highest realm of illumined truth we each can attain at this time. Now, Mother, Father, God, we place ourselves in service to you, to humanity. PLEN and I place ourselves in service to all of you tonight. We ask that only that which is direct from you be permitted into our perceptions, and that all else of the lower mind be kept out. And we ask that only that which is direct from you be permitted through us. And because we have asked this, we consider it so. So be it. And I'll ask all of you to stay in this beautiful space that we've created. We're going to go ahead and take a minute to hold some space for the planet and humanity. So I'm going to ask you to move up that beautiful Christed shaft of light. We're going to take it right up into the Christ consciousness or the unity consciousness grid around the planet. I'll ask each of you to just internally um, set your intention to be of service, to be used as a vessel, and uh, however will serve the highest good of all concerned. And let's just take a minute to let the energy run. Excellent. 
So now take another deep breath and come on back with me. Pelian, how was that for you? Fantastic. I was flying was around safe. like Peter Pan. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. That's wonderful. Um, one thing I do want to say uh, regarding what we just did, a lot of people uh, who are asked to do something like that when they do it, if they don't experience seeing anything, you know, in their inner sight, a lot of people will think that there isn't anything going on. So I just wanted to take a second and assure you that, um, you know, it doesn't, you don't really even have to be there to witness it. It's going on. If the intention was there from your heart, I promise you that it's happening, right? And uh, it doesn't really matter that you walk away feeling like not a whole lot happened. I think, I think last week, didn't we talk about how, like, especially when people talk about meditation, it can yeah. be, you know, disconcerting for others because they feel like they're doing it wrong or whatever. Okay, so this kind of falls into that same thing. Um, you are absolutely being of service if you are in your heart and we do this, you know, together to move up into that grid consciously and hold that kind of space of loving equanimity. You absolutely are being um, a very powerful um vehicle for spirit to move and uh, so for those of you who don't feel anything you know don't worry about it you're doing exactly what you need to do and uh, when the time comes if it makes sense for you to see something feel something hear something then you will and all I can say is that it's perfect as it is and just allow it to be what it is you don't have to question it um, or doubt it just allow it to be what it is okay very good we had a nice full moon, didn't we? I felt a nice shift in energy, which was good. I felt, I felt like things were much lighter today, which was really needed, <laughs> right? <laughs> Who knows how long it'll last, but it was lovely for today. <laughs> Very good. Um, do we have anything that we need to uh, kind of close up from last week that you're aware of? Or did we really hit everything last week? Uh, well, we we did a good job at hitting it, but there were a couple of things that that did come up that we talked about before. Do you want to do that, or do you want to go into uh, Buddhist quote first? Uh, let's let's do what 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 you've got there. Okay. Uh, so the first thing was um, how when something comes up, it it can be a trigger or something that needs to be looked at. How it's very uh, you should be able to take cues from the body. Because mm -hmm. it can be very subtle, yes. but people don't realize it. Right. Um, you know, because I know we talked about constriction around the heart, yes. but that was a huge clue. But um, things like uh, when you have that moment of, oh, and you feel it just run through your body. Yes. <laughs> um, also, like when your throat closes up or dry mouth or you get that feeling in your stomach. Uh, some people get headaches or people get tense in their neck and shoulders. Those are all cues yes or clues both <laughs> <laughs> and you did that so well I don't know that I need to say anything <laughs> <laughs> they are cues uh, and it's it's interesting it, it always seemed to me like the the things that come that literally will turn your stomach upside down I would in my experience those energetics have been related to things I would call anchor points. Like those are the things where the attachment is so strong and you have been in such resistance to the other side of it that it literally is like, um, oh, well, we're down here in the South. So you look at houses out on the coast and they're all built up on stilts, right? So like those are like anchoring the house in and that's how I see those kinds of attachments. They're like those big stilts, you know, and when one gets triggered, you know, you feel it, you know, just as if one got knocked out. Um, and, and, you know, they used to do this. They used to, like, guides would purposely pull your anchor points. That's what they called it. And literally, it could make you throw up. It's a, it's a really interesting thing to have an anchor point pulled. But you will know when um, something that we would call an anchor point, meaning it's, a, it's an identifier that is held so strongly that it literally is one of the things anchoring um, you to to this reality, uh, you'll know when those get pulled because you come up onto a, a threshold that you will absolutely feel physically. 
you know, you could feel uh, dizzy or you could feel nauseous. You could feel extremely hungry. You could feel extremely tired, like just all of a sudden, like, oh my gosh, I have to go to bed, you know, um, or extremely agitated. I've had, I've had people sitting, um, one beautiful woman sitting in my uh, living room with me doing some work one day and, uh, and, and I pulled, uh, well, not I, but an anchor point got pulled and she just literally just couldn't sit there anymore. She had to get up and walk out of the house, <laughs> you know, like she just couldn't do it. Now, of course, the best thing to do is to just sit there uh, because there's something, the anchor, um, when the anchor gets triggered like that and the threshold comes, the threshold is there because the lower mind is attempting to use like everything in, in its capacity to get you to back off, so to speak. And that's why the threshold comes because the body is the perfect thing to use because everyone is so highly identified with the physical form that if it can trigger you physically, um, you'll pay attention, right? And then because your attention turns to the body, now you've backed off as far as whatever it was that was there to be seen and now you aren't going to be capable of seeing it. So when that does happen, you just want to kind of ride it out as far as whatever physically is going on and don't give in to the impulse um, that's presenting itself as far as, oh, I need to eat something or I have to take a nap or whatever it is. It's like you have to push through it. And those are moments where, you know, it does take um, an enormous amount of will to, to do that kind of thing because they are tough and they come really tough. But yeah, those, those subtle cues... Uh, some are not so subtle and others are extremely subtle. And yes, witnessing constriction around the heart is a very subtle thing and very hard to see initially. But once you've seen it once, you kind of, you know, uh, you can't miss it at that point. Um, but yeah, you know, you have to think too that uh, within your chakra system, uh, the chakras are it's uh i don't want to get into this whole topic today but the the chakras are there each one is represented by a particular ray of light and that ray of light comes in from source um pure absolutely pure and what happens is is because uh, consciousness has fallen here when it hits the the particular chakra that it's associated with um it gets broadcast out uh, in not its pure form anymore. It gets disqualified, and the color actually changes. So here's a shocker for all of you listening, because not many of you are aware of this, even though it's very old information. Um, but the colors that you all have associated with the chakra system, you know, red, orange, yellow, green, you know, the whole thing, um, those are actually the disqualified colors, so when you focus on the, that color for your chakra, you're actually focusing on the, the wrong color and the focus should be on the correct color. Now, another time we can get into that, that's really more advanced work. And there's a reason that we don't really teach that until people have done a lot of dissolution work um, because, well, I won't get into it. Anyway, just understand that this is what's happening. The, all of the, the chakras and those rays of light are here to, you know, you're God in form, right? So you're here to be God and be the will of God in form. So we get the, the energies for the chakras that are here to, uh, you know, emanate out from us. And without the personal self-attachment, then God, as each one of you, gets to move through this world from, um, you know, its divine space and, and to create, you know, from that place. Um, but because the uh, the I, the identified self, is so um, prevalent and attached, then the energy comes in and and it gets it gets contorted. It's almost like it gets flipped upside down because now it's not about God moving through this physical form. It's about me, and it just changes everything. So you know, either way, you're the creator, right? It's just one side is the pure creator. The other side is the exact opposite of that. Um, you know, so people who, who say they want to become a creator, no, 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 you're doing it. I mean, you've created this entire universe within your own consciousness that you're 
experiencing right now. You know, everything, um, I, I was sitting with a beautiful thought today, I think it was today, um, you know, I love, I love paradox because that's how, how everything is done. And I was just looking at the concept that, you know, you can never be alone but yet you can only be alone. <laughs> right? <laughs> so a lot of people just got the Scooby-Doo look, huh? <laughs> okay, so you can never be alone in the sense that all of this is you. All of this is you, okay? Understand that. And this is all happening within your own consciousness. This isn't happening. This, this world you're in, this reality you're walking through is not happening outside of you. It's happening within you, all right? And because it's happening within you, you've, you've created all of it. All the people, everything that you witness, all of it, it's, it's all you. So you can't ever be alone, can you? But yet at the same time, you always are alone <laughs> because there is only one. There is only one, and you are that. She was writing. That must have been pretty good. <laughs> Got to get these gems down. <laughs> um, I have to let me just say something really. I don't know why. Just because. So Pielian took it upon herself to start um, taking photographs she had taken and take, taking my uh, things that I had said at different during different sessions in the past, you know. And so. She sent one and then she sent another one today. And like both times, I literally wrote back to her and I was like, did I actually say that? <laughs> <laughs> I have no idea. It's hysterical. I was like, wow, that was actually lovely. <laughs> Are you sure I said that? <laughs> oh, it's beautiful. When you're present, it's like you're, you aren't the one speaking. And I don't really know how to say that other than that, you know, um, it was very interesting tonight when I was doing the protection, um, <laughs> the words were all coming and I was actually witnessing separate thought running simultaneously and all of it's just functioning, right? And it's really amazing to be in that space to, to just, you're just kind of there watching all of it, you know, and here it is just happening. It's a beautiful thing. Really lovely. All right. So we're actually going to take what we just spoke about yes. and move into something else okay. uh, because thought has to precede emotion. We were talking about yeah. you know, the thoughts that come and then what happens after that. Do you need more? <laughs> it's going to be one of these nights. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So moving, it's a good thing I take notes. <laughs> so yes. We were talking okay, so about like self-help stuff and monitoring your thoughts and trying right. to change your ways. Yes, this is, this is something I wanted to, to bring to everyone because, uh, well, because it needs to be spoken. Now, remember, okay, I have to preface it. This is so important. Remember, what is true, I, uh, I use that word lightly, but what appears to be true in this third dimensional reality that we're living in, this construct that you, that you are all living in every day is not necessarily true outside of this construct. So when you get into uh, a non-polarized space, the things that, that function as truth here are not necessarily going to function as truth there. Okay. Now here's the, the thing though, because everyone can say, okay, well, I, I guess I could see that. But here's the kicker. The kicker is you have to be very careful that you don't fall into... Um, the taking the stance that one is preferable to the other, okay? Because they are both equal. And this is really, really, really important, um, especially because this is where uh, especially spiritual ego comes in so easily. I, I love this. Uh, when you have, say, spiritual teachers, right? So there are some spiritual teachers who are very, like, you know, what you could call kind of 101, Right? And then there are some spiritual teachers who, through their, um, you know, th through spirit, can literally guide you all the way off the life-death cycle. And it runs the whole gamut here. And we have to be really careful 
Because as you move along your path, you will notice the transition from one teacher into another teacher, right? And that teacher could come in the form of a book or a video series or something. It doesn't have to be someone you're actually, you know, present with. And the, the, the pitfall that people run into is thinking that, well, I've, I've kind of conquered that or I've learned that and now I'm moving on to the other. So now I'm better, right? And this teacher is better. And that's what everybody thinks, of course, because that's how this world seems to work, doesn't it? Right? Like I learned um, addition, subtraction, and now I can learn multiplication and division, and that makes me better, right? That seems to make sense. Okay. doesn't make sense, really, from where I stand, because they're all equal. The fact of the matter is, if you didn't learn addition and subtraction first, you couldn't learn multiplication and division. So you don't negate the value of learning addition and subtraction. See what I'm saying? And so it's the same thing when you look at spiritual teachers, right? Because I see a lot of that, of course, g- given what I do. But I see a lot of people, uh, a lot of light, you know, quote unquote, light workers out there who downplay certain teachers because they're, you know, quote unquote, past that or beyond that now. And that is spiritual ego that has no place in walking this path. They're all valid. They're all necessary. They're all perfect, just as they are. So. It may be that, you know, the, the guidance I can offer someone um, can take them deeper. But if they haven't done some of the other levels, they won't be ready for the guidance that I could offer them, right? So you have to be really careful that you don't ever talk down about anybody who's doing whatever it is that they're doing because what they're doing is serving a very... A unique purpose and a very um, needed purpose, and it's perfect and beautiful just as it is. Um, mind always wants to categorize everything, and it wants to put everything into boxes that says, you know, this is right and this is wrong, and this is good, but this is better, right? This was bad, but this one's worse. And what it can't see is that everything exists on this big sliding scale, you know. And it's just a matter of degrees, right? Everything is a matter of degrees. Hate is the same as love, but it's a matter of degrees. You see what what I'm saying? It's really important. And I I don't know why this is coming up because I had no idea that was going to come. But apparently it needs to tonight. Um, We all, it's, you know, it's just the way that, that the lower mind is. It's always looking for something to pull in where I can identify with a certain piece that I can then say is better than something else, right? Well, you know, she's, she, she's a good hairstylist, but I do hair better, right? I mean, we're always looking for something, something to judge another so that we can say that we're better at that or that they should know better and in, in a indirect way, what we're saying is that we do know better, right? That's a beautiful hidden little gem. Take a look at, at your own life and see where you're doing that every day. Why did she do that? She shouldn't do that, right? What's, what are we really saying? What we're really saying is, I know better. I wouldn't do that. Therefore, she shouldn't do that. And she should know better because I'm right. Yeah. And that's what's sitting there. That's what's sitting there. Sometimes it feels like I stepped into a boxing ring when we start sets. <laughs> Got the gloves off tonight. Okay. So I'm not here to beat you up, but I am here to ask you to really start paying attention because this stuff happens unconsciously. I mean, you're, you aren't even aware of it until someone like me comes along and forces you to become aware of it. And now that I've planted it, you can get angry and you can walk away and that's fine. It's your prerogative. Or you can allow it to sit there and kind of ruminate. And you can disagree with me, and that's fine, too. Go ahead and disagree with me, you know. I'll take that challenge, and I'll keep pointing it out, and I'll keep pointing it out. And at some, at some point along the road, you're actually going to see it. And it's going to be like, oh, my gosh, there it is. I just did that, you know. And I never thought I did that. 
I'm not one of those people, right? <laughs> and everybody is. And that's okay. That's just the programming here. It's all right. So when it comes to um, self-help, right, which is a very psychological thing, here again, we have to look from this place. So to within like the whole kind of self-help thing, remember like self-help books were like huge in the 70s and early 80s, right? And they have a beautiful place, right? Because psychologically, you can be healthy here and you can be unhealthy here, right? Both of them absolutely are occurring. And so is there validity in, um, you know, r recognizing that, gosh, I really am like a, a, uh, a worry wart, or I really am just a, a real nag, you know? Or name something that you would think of as a negative thing, right? You could see that about yourself and then be like, wow, like, that's not pleasant, you know, and that's really not who I want to be. And then you can take steps to change that, right? So you have a lot of um, camps out there who teach, you know, kind of change your, what is it, change your thoughts, change your what? Something. All I can hear is save the cheerleader, save the world. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, <laughs> whatever that saying is, but it's about, you know, like, like they're your thoughts. So you have to control the thoughts. Or like affirmations. Is that what you mean? Um, no, just the sense of like, oh, I just said something negative. Now I have to flip it around uh, and now I have to say something positive because I don't, oh, well, I can't be that. I'm negative all the time. I don't want to be negative anymore. So I'm going to be positive, right? Okay. Is there a place for that here on earth? Absolutely. 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 Okay. I said it three times. I really meant it. Will it get you closer to walking off the life death cycle? Absolutely not. And why? Because all you're doing is repolarizing. So you're polarized on one side. This is, you know, this is me and my name is Sally and I am um, a, uh, I'm, uh, I suffer from depression and I'm always worried and I, what? I yell at people too much and you know, I always assume the worst of everybody. That's Sally. And, and she, she's been doing that forever. And then it took about, you know, six different failed relationships with people telling her the same exact thing for her to look and go, wow, like maybe there's something to that. <laughs> right? Most people would say, that's not true. You know, so maybe after like six times she goes, oh, like I've heard that a lot of times. Maybe there's something to it. So she starts digging and doing, you know, a little bit of reading and whatever, and then realizes, oh, wow, like I really am doing that. And so she goes, oh, well, that's not good. Well, there's your big clue right there. That's not good, right? Polarization. And we need sound effects. Bang. <laughs> like we need a sound effect for that. And then she says, so, so what I need to do is I need to be the other. Okay. While it's lovely that Sally is going to take the steps to become the other, and now she's happy Sally, right? It doesn't do anything to dissolve unhappy Sally. See what I'm saying? It still sits there. Now she's just, she's repressing it. <laughs> and she's in denial about it, pushing it back. And so now she's going to actually see more of unhappy Sally in the world around her as she's got her happy Sally face on. I have some students who really will associate very well with this. And I think it's in A Course in Miracles where um, Yeshua talks about being in, you know, that the life is a dream and that sometimes life is a happy dream and sometimes life is an unhappy dream, but it's all a dream. And this is exactly what I'm referring to. Within that dynamic, you can move into, you know, happy, healthy Sally, and Sally can be living a happy dream here. She could be living the dream of, you know, being a spiritual seeker who is living in the space of all light and love and everything is glorious, and that's a happy dream. Or she can be living the life she always led and have it be an unhappy dream 
But either way, they're both dreams, right? And so what is, you know, does one strive to be the one who thinks that they are the dream or is one ready to now move into the space where the dreamer is lucid in the dream and can actually witness it as just a dream and not attach to any of it. And isn't that the, 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 the beautiful, beautiful thing, you know, the objective observer when it comes in and it's very strong, it can be in, you know, pure peace in the middle of a battle zone because it's not attached to the story of what's going on. So I brought this up because I, I just want people to, it's a gauge for you, you know, kind of if you're, if you're just dead set on changing yourself, then you have to look at that, right? Because if you're dead set on changing yourself, it means that there's stuff that you don't like, you flat out don't like about yourself, which tells me that there's stuff that you haven't accepted about yourself and you haven't kind of loved free. It's a word that Patricia Kotorobles uses, you know, loving it free. I think it's beautiful. Because isn't that what we have to do is just love all of it free, you know? Everyone wants to say, oh, look, you know, like I'm a very happy, healthy, well-adjusted person and we all strive to be that. Well, okay, but why is that preferable to any other state of beingness here, right? If you weren't attached, would it matter? And this is like a question that I get all the time. Oh my gosh, this may be the question. What's her question? Is it about why do bad things happen to good people? Something like that. I don't know. But that question does come all the time. You know, why does God allow people to suffer? And I hate answering that question. <laughs> and here it is. Just coming. Because if, imagine for a second, because you'll have to. But imagine you're God. If you are God and you are not a personal God, like everybody wants to create God to be, everyone wants God to be the man in the sky, right? With his laptop keeping score <laughs> of who's doing what, who was bad and who was good, and how we're going to judge it. You know, y'all say, I don't believe that, but when it really comes down to it, everybody believes that because it's, it's so ingrained in the collective that everybody thinks that's going on. Um, it's the imprint. So if you're God, who is an impersonal God, and the point of any level of manifestation was to experience yourself, would you have any attachment whatsoever to what the experience was? Let me think about that. Because everyone here wants to say, well, if I was God, I wouldn't want to suffer. Well, well what is suffering? If you're all that is, and, and you're impersonal in the way that you're viewing it, and you're, you're just observing it, you're not believing it, you're observing it, right? If you're just observing it from an impersonal place, is any experience preferable to another? It's all just experience, right? It's very neutral, very, very neutral. So people who have some kind of a sense that, you know, God should do something about that. Well, God is doing something about that through everybody who's doing something about that. <laughs> right? <laughs> and God's doing something about that through all of those who are not doing something about that. Because all of those who are doing and not doing, which is still a form of doing, non-action is a form of action. It's all God experiencing itself. And it all really is perfect. This, this paradigm here is functioning exactly the way it's supposed to. People don't like to hear that because they think that, you know, you really can make change here and make it stick, right? Not at the particular, you know, the, within each dimension there are different octaves. Well, where we're sitting right now, this isn't the place where we're going to witness uh, unity consciousness. It's just not going to happen. The unified field 
doesn't exist within polarization. It's outside of it. That's where we're going to experience the ideals of, you know, like the founders of the United States, the ideals of, of socialists, of communists, like all, it's all the same stuff. If you really look at it, everyone just thinks really, if, if everyone goes into their heart space, everyone really wants the same thing. Everyone wants to be loved and everyone, and everyone wants to be accepted and everyone wants to have, you know, a nice, beautiful existence where we're equal. I mean, everyone wants that deep inside. And that is the unified field, right? The unified field, if you're in that space, the choices that you make, um, the actions that you take come out of the mindset of what is in the highest good of all concerned. It is not about what is in my highest good. It isn't. And a lot of people don't like to hear that, but that's the truth. Because sometimes something will come and you're going to see the, you're going to see the two sides. One of them is not in your highest good. If you look at it from a personal place and the other one is in your highest good, but is not going to benefit the whole. And you have an opportunity there to actually move from unity consciousness, which would, you know, sacrifice itself to be a benefit to the whole, right? That's, that's just what it would do. And most people aren't ready to do that quite yet, but we're taking steps. So it's a beautiful thing. So, yeah, so I guess, um, I think I've kind of covered what I wanted to concerning, you know, it doesn't, again, I'll repeat it. Remember, like when it comes to self-help books, I am not, I repeat, not saying that they are a bad thing or that they are unnecessary. That is not what I'm saying. So if any, for any reason you took it that way, that's your projection. <laughs> You've got to hang up there and you need to look at that because that is not what I'm saying. They're all valid. They're all beautiful and equal. Okay. But there is a point where every single person, because of their lifetimes of um, uh, work and the balancing of their karmic load will move into the space where they truly are ready to really take the steps to transcend duality. And in that space, um, you, you move into a space where it, it just doesn't, the whole concept of, you know, I, I should be this and not this, or um, I'd rather be this than this, it just falls away. It just falls away because it just doesn't matter because you weren't any of it, you know. It's like you're, you're both because you are uh, kind and cruel at the same time. And everybody can look and see moments in their life where they've been kind and moments in their life where they've been cruel. They just have decided that one is preferable to the other. So they hold one side as being, you know, better. And then they decide that that's the one they want to be because they want to be on the good side, right? They don't want to be on the bad side. If they choose to be on uh, the bad side, they're doing it because they do really want to be on the good side. <laughs> it always comes down to that anyway. It's kind of that attitude of indifference, you know, it hides very deep pain when it, when it shows up. So that's where everybody is sitting. And then really everyone, you know, there will be a time for everyone where that, that fire is, that's been kind of smoldering uh, in your heart just lights up and it's time, you know, and you'll know it because um, one day someone will, can be in a space saying what I'm saying and it could really just tick you off and make you want to walk away. And then another day you'll hear it and you'll go, wow, I wonder if there's something to that. And maybe I need to look at that. Right. And it just doesn't become about, you know, it's funny cause it's still about me for a while. Right. Because we're still the seeker. Remember, the lower mind is playing all the roles, so it plays the role of the seeker as well to help walk, walk us home. Um, but that, that fire starts burning brighter and brighter, you know, and you have huge amounts of help coming from outside, which is, uh, you know, you can't put a price on that. 
and just know that it's always there. I have a student who's really getting um, more in touch with the guidance that is um, presenting itself. And it's interesting because in the beginning, you don't really sense all the help that you do have. But anytime you call on anyone, they're, they're absolutely present with you. Absolutely. So it doesn't matter if you feel them or see them go back to the beginning of our program again. It's the same thing, right? If you call from your heart, I promise you they're there. Whoever it is you're calling, they're there. All right. How are we doing here? Oh, my goodness. 943. Okay. I did want to get to, um, and if anyone has any kind of further question about all of that, little discourse, feel free to uh, write in to our email. I, I think it's set up as questions for Shusada at the Shambhala Center dot com. You can send us questions anytime and then I'll field them in these programs. Um, so I wanted to talk today about my like favorite quote because it, it was very relevant to me this week. Do we have enough time for that? Because we actually um, want to do this song and that's like in four minutes. Four minutes? Okay. Well, I can, because you wanted to talk about the song and then play the song. and then Yeah. We can do this, though. We can take four minutes. Okay. So, um, three minutes and 50 seconds now. So, <laughs> <laughs> so anyhow. Um, see, now I forgot what I was saying. Oh, the cup is already broken. It's like my favorite quote of the Buddhist. I love it. I love it. I love it. I love it. Because once you really get it, you just love it. The cup is already broken being, you know, that's kind of the source of your suffering. Meaning that everything that, you know, remember the lower mind, it's always searching for creating this beautiful space and then maintaining it and making it stable. And of course it can't because everything, it's, it's diametrically opposed to how the universe works. Like everything changes every second in the universe. So it's a, there's just, it's a no one situation for the mind, but it tries really hard to do it. Right. And this quote that the cup is already broken is just so beautiful because what, what the Buddha is saying to us is that anything that comes into existence here because of the nature of this reality has to also go out of existence, right? Whether it is the cup, right? A cup that was uh, created by a potter that you use to put your tea in and you love the cup, and you treasure it, and it was given to you by your guru, and you love it more than anything in the world, there is bound to come a day when something will happen, and that cup will break. And what the Buddha is saying by using the cup as his, um, you know, his device here, is he's saying, but it, it was already broken. As soon as it came into existence, it was already broken. It was just a matter of when. Not a matter of if, it's a matter of when. And what it teaches us is to really be present. And that is such a beautiful space when you learn to, to sit in it. Um, it's such a beautiful space that in the moment of, of just pure presence with the mug, you love it from a place that's not attached to it. It's that pure divine love that you have for the the structure of the mug or how it feels in your hand or you know how the tea tastes coming out of it right it's just beautiful and you treasure it but you don't cling to it right because as happened to me i had two beautiful very expensive mice and mugs that were given to me by a very dear person in, in germany and this week i picked one up and they were nestled and they stuck together and the bottom mug fell and it smashed into a million pieces on my granite countertop. And what the personal self would do with that would be to look at the broken mug and be upset. Oh my gosh, like I can't afford another one. I'll never be able to, have, I can only get that in Germany. I can't, this whole thing, right? And it can suffer. That suffering, that story is suffering. Or... In, from a, from a non-attached place, it was, the reality was, oh, broken mug, clean up mug, throw mug in garbage, right? Walk to other mug, fill it with tea, and treasure the experience of this mug. And at that point, the other one's gone. It's done. It's gone. 
doesn't exist. Never existed. It's just done. Because if you're just present, the story doesn't have to linger. It just doesn't have to linger. And it is, it is our attachment, right? I, it's the attachment that comes out of the unmet need, right? Remember, sitting at the very base are your unmet needs. The unmet needs um, create the desire to get whatever it is that's unmet. It is the desire that leads to the attachment to it, okay? So something is filling your need for love, let's say another person, and that person leaves, and now all of a sudden you're suffering and you're miserable because you're attached to what that person represented to you and the need that was being filled. And you think that that need can't be filled if that person isn't there. And it's absolutely untrue. Because when you're purely present and in love with the self, capital S, that you are, there's no one else that needs to be, uh, that needs to complete you. That whole, you know, you complete me thing, what a load of crap that is. You're already complete. Now, you can be with another person and have it be a beautiful expression of love and treasure every single moment of it. And it's divine. It's amazing. And you can have an intimacy with someone that is just beyond anything you thought possible. However, it's the attachment that is the thing that just doesn't have any place in true love. It just doesn't. Now, of course, the third dimensional personality is going to, you know, if, if someone you love uh, transitions out of the physical, you'll, you'll grieve that. And that's okay. There's nothing wrong with that. Allow that to be what it is. But then you can back yourself up out of it, come into your understanding of non-attachment and just be okay with it as it is. Okay. So now should I do the thing? That's probably enough for that. Yes. yes? Mm -hmm. Okay. So I was listening to Pandora earlier and this song came on that I've heard a bazillion times before and I love and I never really paid much attention to it other than I love the song. And tonight I heard it and the words were like, I stopped and I was like, oh my gosh, holy cow, like why did I never see that? So I would like to read the actual words to you um, because when he sings it, you probably aren't going to catch all the words. And some of it, for most of you, you're not quite going to get. And I'm, I'll try to kind of say a few words about it before we finish. But it's a song of, of awakening and um, the, the different stages that one moves through in, in the awakening process. And it's so beautiful. So let me just read this. And it's, it's kind of like um, prosy. So it, it's not always going to rhyme or whatever. Just stay with me. Okay. Okay. Climbing up on Salisbury Hill, I could see the city light. Wind was blowing. Time stood still. Eagle flew out of the night. He was something to observe. Came in close. I heard a voice standing, stretching every nerve. Had to listen. Had no choice. I did not believe the information. I just had to trust imagination. My heart going boom, boom, boom. Son, he said, grab your things. I've come to take you home. To keep in silence, I resigned. My friends would think I was a nut, turning water into wine. Open doors would soon be shut. So I went from day to day, though my life was in a rut, till I thought of what I'd say which connection I should cut. I was feeling part of the scenery. I walked right out of the machinery, my heart going boom, boom, boom. Hey, he said, grab your things. I've come to take you home. Yeah, back home. When illusions spin her net, I'm never where I want to be. In liberty, she pirouette when I think that I am free watched by empty silhouettes who close their eyes but still can see. No one taught them etiquette. I will show another me. Today, I don't need a replacement. I'll tell them what the smile on my face meant. My heart going boom, boom, boom. Hey, I said, you can keep my things. They've come to take me home. 
the name of the song is Salisbury Hill, and it's a, it's an older song by Peter Gabriel. It is beautiful. In the beginning, um, it's three stanzas, and in the beginning, the first one, it is his experience of of witnessing the divine. It's the eagle, you know, that's that's God, and it comes. And as he says, you know, he doesn't have a choice; he has to listen. You know, and he says, I did not believe the information because, of course, mind wouldn't. I just had to trust imagination, it's, and, which is just so accurate. So, you know, the eagle says, you know, grab your things. I've come to take you home. And then in the second stanza, he says that he was resigned to stay in silence because his friend would think he was crazy, <laughs> right? And uh, he basically says, like, if I let these people know, like, what I know then they're all going to think I'm nuts and um, certain my relationships will cease to be the way I'm used to them. So he goes from day to day and he's in this life rut, right? And then he kind of gets it one day. It's like he's in that space for a while. And then he says, I was feeling part of the scenery. But then he says, I walked right out of the machinery, the machinery being, you know, this whole reality, his heart going boom, boom. And I love it. It always goes, always goes back to the heart, right? Because it's the heart that, that awakens. The constrictions fall away. And the, the awakening is like that, that heart just ex expansion. And he says, you know, again, he's hearing, he's hearing the eagle. He's hearing God saying, grab your things. I've come to take you home. And now he says, yeah, back home. So he's telling us this is where you're meant to be, back home, right? Not here. This is not the real part. And then he's talking about illusion, and when illusion is spinning her net here, I'm never where I want to be. Well, of course. And that's what I talked about earlier. You know, mind can't create the space where you want to be. You'll, you'll never find it here. And when he thinks he's free, he recognizes that even then, he, he, there is no freedom here. And so the beautiful thing is at the end, you know, he says to them, I'll, now I don't need a replacement anymore. I'll tell them what the smile on my face meant my heart going boom, boom, boom. Hey, I've, I said, you can keep my things. They've come to take me home because at that point, anything of the world just does not matter anymore. Now, it doesn't mean you lose appreciation for the world because if anything, you have far more appreciation from, for the, this world when you can stand outside of it. Far, far more appreciation. But at that point, the only thing that matters ultimately is to go home, right? To go home to the place you never left, <laughs> which is exactly what it is because you haven't left it. Um, but there you go. So we're going to actually play this song. Those of you who think you have to meditate to slow songs, you're going to be in for a shocker tonight. But we're going to use this as a meditation, and I want you to all climb into uh, the jump seat of your heart, and I want you to ride this all the way with me in meditation. And um, we'll be back with you next week. So, uh, again, our website is uh, ShambalaCenter.com. Feel free to check us out there or on Facebook. And uh, we love to have your comments and questions. And I'm going to say good night now, and uh, I'll be with you through the meditation. Love you so much. Enjoy it. Thank you. Thank you.